Hello everyone, welcome to TSAM Digital. My name is Amy and today I'm joined by Dr. Ligia Catherine Arias Barrera, who is a professor of financial law at the Externado de Colombia University. So welcome Catherine, it's great to have you. Thank you, Amy, for inviting me uh, to this um, YouTube uh, talk and then to explore some of the uh, main uh, queries around ESG derivatives and how the industry is moving forward towards them. You're very welcome. I'm excited to have you here today to hear a bit more about derivatives. So I know you've got quite a few roles. So would you mind just telling our viewers a little bit about your background and your experience, both on the academic side and professionally? Yeah. Uh, but um, I'm a Colombia uh, qualified lawyer, firstly. And then I started the path to, to study at the UK. I did an LLM in commercial and corporate law at Queen Mary University of London uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, then I, I had the chance to do my PhD at the University of Warwick. Uh, and I mainly focus on the study of OTC derivatives basically from the regulatory and supervision perspective. Um, after I finished the PhD, I published my first book, um, which is on regulation and supervision of the OTC derivatives market. Basically, what I covered there was um, how the UK uh, implemented the EU regulation uh, after the global financial crisis um, and, and also somehow compare with the US perspective um, on regulating central counterparties as new intermediaries uh, in the OTC derivatives market. Um, so that's from my academic background. And, and professionally, um, I actually had a consultancy firm that uh, works uh, with some of the and users uh, in, in OTC derivatives, particularly. Uh, I also work on uh, advising on regulatory reforms um, in here in Colombia, and then some other work in the UK. And also I had a chance to, to, to work with the Nigerian Central Bank a few years back uh, as an external advisor um, in this role. In this, in this, in this part of, of growing uh, professionally, I, I had uh, the opportunity to work with the IMF as an external expert um, in, in different topics uh, around um, financial regulation uh, regarding fintech um, and how we use fintech as a, as a way to um, uh, broaden up the access uh, to, to financial services, particular to those, um, parts of the population that are unbanked uh, and uh, within the uh, international uh, ch chamber of commerce uh, it, it's it's um there's it's a combination of academic and professional uh, work uh, because we had yeah, at the sustainable finance group several meetings uh, where we had the chance to discuss uh, some of the key issues and how the ICC can contribute uh, for the um, uh, company sector, corporate sector, uh, to move um, in, into achieving these um, commitments around sustainable development goals and and so on. So, so it, it has been quite a a, a few uh, years working as a consultant, as a regulatory um, advisor uh, in different roles. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like you've been very busy. <laughs> so I think let's start with the over-the-counter derivatives, That's a, since that's a big area that you do work on quite frequently. So looking at that, you mentioned that you sort of have a lot of regulatory expertise and you deal with the form. So can you tell us a bit about the strategies that you've worked on, like, for example, when it comes to ensuring a good contract and ensuring transparency and risk management? Because I, I know that's an area that you focused on. Yeah, I mean, um, the focus that I've had from the academic perspective and then moving to the professional uh, roles that I have played, uh, makes, makes me think that derivatives are the result of combining certain features uh, that give the counterparties uh, the possibility to look for capital raising and management of credit risk. Uh, we, we, we tend to, to think about many different types of risk, but of course, credit risk is at the core of, uh, let's say, the majority of transactions here. Um, therefore, most of the uh, characteristics of these transactions will 
end up responding to a specific needs of clients and investors. Uh, this explains the, um, the why the derivatives market in any transaction can be perfectly reshaped to satisfy client needs. This means that somehow if we if we want to see in each transaction, in each contract, uh, tools that um, ensure or enhance transparency and better risk management, um, that, that may be a bit tricky sometimes because clients and investors' interests are not always uh, aligned with regulatory objectives. Um, they, they are participants and they are related to the same market, but their interest in, from what I say, their um, uh, perspectives of risk uh, can, can be quite different. Uh, what is very attractive for clients and investors might be regarded as very risky from the regulator's perspective. Um, so, so one, one way that I have identified and one strategy, let's say, that I have identified is to uh, bring to the drawing up of our contracts uh, the risk-based approach to regulation, which is a strategy that is well known in financial services, uh, has been implemented in different regulatory regimes, so it is n it's not, a new net, not, not a new language. Um, but within that strategy, the, the most uh, attractive uh, feature, we, we could say, is that we have to uh, build up a dialogue between industry, market participants, regulators, supervisors, in order to try to balance all those interests that are uh, in play in, in, the, in, in that way, uh, find um, the better approach to solve a particular problem. Let's, let's think about uh, speculation. Speculation is a practice that we see, of course, in many different parts of financial system. Uh, somehow it's been perceived as a legitimate interest but when speculation becomes a general practice, when you have many, many participants in the market uh, taking advantage of a speculative positions in their contracts, uh, that might become a source of crisis, that may become problematic. Uh, so one of the approaches that actually is built on this a strategy of risk-based regulation uh, by using the features and in, in, in the uh, and the main characteristics of the, the strategy uh, is to understand and uh, let's say the extent of that the speculation when it deserves to be controlled when we can just let the market use the practice and um, without having any any need to to us to control to to prohibit uh, those sort of of, of um, uh, positions and transactions that are merely uh, speculative. Um, of course, uh, if we see different problems in in uh, that might be uh, in the court of financial derivatives, um, not all of them have been tackled by regulation. Um, after the global financial crisis, the debate was on how to increase transparency and to provide better risk management. But the, 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 the discourse there was risk management in uh, thinking on the, in the entire market, the entire OTC derivatives market. Um, not exclusively uh, thinking on risk management for each transaction. Um, uh, in, in the end, we see that many of these uh, instruments and some uh, clauses that we included in our contracts can help to, co to, to can contribute to achieve exactly the same the same um, uh, objective, um, but from different perspectives of risk, and, and that's that's more or less the the idea that I use in my research, and then in some of the. Uh, um, a consultant work that I've been doing, um, and how how to better uh, balance 
the, the, the discourse around risk and then moving into the real, let's say, particular cases on how to draw our contracts in order to help regulators help supervisors to achieve uh, their goals uh, we, we we have to see that um, beyond individual interests the the regulatory objective that benefit all the entire market all participants is to preserve stability um in in actually all these uh sorts of practices that might go against uh, stability in order to privilege so few few interests in the market few participants are the ones that um, have been causing problems and and, and and leaving us with instability this financial distress and so on so my idea now is to question whether that risk-based approach to regulation can help us now to understand sustainability goals um, we we in the in the work the book that I've been working and the research that I've been doing um, I ask where and how it is possible to repurpose the use of financial derivatives to satisfy sustainability needs um, how to link uh, some of these products to um, somehow control the way corporate sector, those who use derivatives, investors in general, um, are um, are committed uh, to um, comply with sustainable uh, with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and actually promote a change of behavior in terms not only on environmental issues, which is more or less the the, the vast majority of the interest now from industry and regulators, but also social issues. Um, it is, it, it, from my perspective, it, you cannot use exactly the same discourse and the same regulatory tools uh, if you want to achieve positive social impact in the developed world. Uh, when, um, but, but if you want to compare, let's say, what happens in the developed world regarding social issues is different from developing countries so uh, it's not it's not a, i mean my proposition is my proposal here sorry is not to to say that is just one solution for all the problems that we have that are covered by the esg um but to customize the regulatory instruments according to local needs domestic needs understanding that in the broader perspective we have to follow the, the international standards that we already have the sustainable development goals the uh, paris agreement of 2015 uh, and, and the other instruments that that uh, on the international level have been um, promoted by regulators by industry uh, as a way to um, explain how they they understand sustainability uh, how they delimit environmental, social, and governance issues um, in each transaction. So basically, that's, that's the, the second part of what I'm doing now, um, is, to, is to identify whether derivatives and financial derivatives in general, the, the market, um, could, could help to, to enhance the, the idea of sustainable finance. Until now, we've seen a particular interest on developing loan market bonds um, with social issues, with green bonds, social bonds, sustainable bonds. Um, and also a part of equity market is moving towards uh, sustainability. Um, what I see is that if we understand derivatives as uh, instru financial instruments that help us to hedge risk in general, risk in general, um, each of these criteria, environmental, social, global, end up being understood by regulators and supervisors as risk as well. So how we could either use the products that we already have or to the, the or designing new products and um, just the, to, to, to help us uh, in this process of managing 
and hedging in the in the best way um, for industry and for the general stability um, it, those ESG risk. Um, so yeah, basically this is what I, what I've seen. I've been I've been. Um, uh, following the International Swaps and Derivatives Association a uh, work on sustainability, um, finding out that they they say ISA says that um, the main advantages of developing financial derivatives related to sustainable finance um, might be in enhancing transparency, price discovery. Uh, and to better manage all the risk associated with any portfolio investment. So, in that sense, I think uh, that there's a, a, a great room for, for discussion and also to contribute um, for the, the better way actually financial derivatives can help us uh, to achieve sustainability uh, objectives and, and goals uh, going beyond, of course, this uh, greenwashing risk that is always there anytime you try to understand and, and work on on sustainability financial instruments uh, one of the risks that is is actually very challenging um to to tackle uh, and to manage uh, is greenwashing um the lack of real commitment from from some uh industry participants corporate sector uh, and so on that's some fantastic insight yeah and I think there's a huge opportunity there as you say that needs to be explored and it's a good point you make as well about what risk is because it's such a vague term and can be used in so many contexts so as you've mentioned the risk-based approach is used across the financial services whether it's anti-money laundering so I think when we think about customizing it to sustainability in finance I mean do you think that that it translates well into climate change risk assessments for example because I know that's something that you also work on yeah, I mean the 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 special focus that we see on climate risk comes from I mean the reality that we are facing every day, um, the negative consequences uh, of climate change have been reflected from what I see in this trend following climate risk for for example financial institutions and for them to change some of the practices and, and, and also these methodologies that they use to um, analyze data and how to report it and how to and try to find um, similarities between climate risk and um, the traditional financial risk. Um, but I, I think uh, that when we approach sustainability, um, the, the most prominent issues are not only related to climate. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, the, um, your location in the world and in the market uh, will, will somehow have an effect, an impact in your perspective. If you, if you see the developing world, if you see political changes, if you see uh, changes in government in different parts of the world, um, there, they have the, 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 there's a common element behind those changes, and, and it's social unrest. And social unrest actually, I think, is a symptom of a bigger problem. Uh, many social needs that have not been covered for a long, long time. Um, something that cannot be attributed exclusively to policies, to governments, no, but uh, to our economic system. So when we approach sustainability from the financial sector, many authors and actually some journalists have made reference to the need to report post-financial system. I, 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 I think it's, it's, not, it's not actually to report post financial system is to make financial system aware of the social function that it has to 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 uh, a, a comply to to have in any 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 country. Even if you are in a developed world, there are many problems regarding limiting ac limited access to credit, for example, limited access to uh, international payments. Um, those sort of very basic things 
for all us as consumers of financial systems have not been covered uh, properly from from the perspective of financial institutions for many different reasons. So I, I guess um, what I what I argue is that sustainability cannot be restricted only to cover what is urgent, of course, uh, which is uh, the, uh, all the, the movement and measures to, to fight a uh, climate change. No, and to contribute to reduce uh, the bad impact that we have in, in environment in general. Um, that, that's the priority. And if we use the risk-based approach a, a language, a, the prioritization of risk means that you understand that many of the interventions, the regulatory tools will be almost exclusively focused on when you what you have said is a priority. But at the same time, um, there are social issues that need to be, I mean, is 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 always um, something that has been probably left behind in financial regulation debate. Uh, the need to contribute to solve some social problems. Uh, so th that's my 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 argument in, in the sense of the social part of the ESG. Um, firstly, to understand what social actually it's about. It's not only about human rights violations, which is a big part of that. It's also about uh, protecting uh, labor rights. It's also about uh, protecting communities that are around the, um, the place where we perform our uh, activities. Is 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 uh, generating wealth for our workers and their families. Um, and, and, and all these measures seem seems to be um, somehow dispersed in, in, in the discourse of social. So one of the key uh, things that I want to do is in, in my in my research and in my book is um, to clarify firstly what is what is the social function of derivatives and how the, a market that has been criticized for a long time for being a value extraction a, a sector within financial within capital markets it can become a, the promoter or one of the promoters a, of 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 the a social function a, in general in financial system but in particular in capital markets um so so that, that would be that would be so, something that I want to 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 emphasize um, and and also the importance to the limit uh, what what other issues we should be including uh, in the social in the social uh, discussions social factor discussion uh, uh, around sustainability um also we we move to governance um to I mean, the, the, I think the first step is to clarify why within sustainability and ESG, G is different from what we already know as uh, social responsible um, behavior from the corporate sector. Um, that also how to break uh, uh, um, some discussions and critiques that corporate governance in general has had for a long time and how and whether this movement is actually different from its predecessors. Uh, how does this uh, work, for example, on stewardship codes that are moving around from the UK and South Africa and in Germany, some, some initiatives that have been uh, well uh, researched and studied, um, represent something different uh, from what we already know from corporate uh, governance business conduct and these uh, codes of ethics that that we already have uh, in in particularly in the largest uh, companies um once we can clarify what g actually is now um there's also uh uh, a second uh, argument there uh, is how G needs to respond to different discourses is different if you if we are in front of a small and medium enterprises and very very small companies and very very small businesses and um, that version let's say of governance uh, has to attend the real needs and the real capabilities of, of those who are in those sectors. If you see the um, a composition of Latin American uh, business um, 
sector, a large majority of the business fall within the category of small and medium enterprises. It is it would, it would be so unhelpful to try to translate the standards that large companies uh, comply in terms of conduct and, and governance uh, to those small and medium enterprises. It's, a, it's, a, it's an additional cost that regulation might bring and, 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 and it will affect actually more that contribute uh, to um, in in the process of making clear for the small and medium enterprises uh, what the commitment to sustainability actually means and what they have to do. Um, so it, uh, as you see, Amy, there's there's a lot to, to be to be clarified and ma many concepts and definitions that we need to discuss in order to agree something that might be comprehensive of all these interests involved in and that's why um, I, I guess we have some international standards that, of course, are very useful and can guide the process within, within local um, area, local authorities. But uh, it is also it is also uh, important to to bear in mind the differences um, around market composition, levels of liquidity, types of participants. Uh, to, to build regulatory instruments that actually help uh, uh, social and local, social, environmental, social governance, uh, local needs. For one example of this different approach uh, is um, one instrument, it is, it's a taxonomy similar to the, Un the European Union uh, Green Finance Taxonomy. Uh, Colombia, as a leading um, a country within the region, designed its own version uh, of the green taxonomy uh, with one particular change. For us, it's not as important um, as might be for the European Union. Uh, those discussions about, about in energy, in the energy, energy sector, uh, how to categorize um, the production of gas. Of course, for us, it's not a priority because we don't do that in a large extent compared to the European Union. But one problem that we haven't resolved and actually is one of the causes of our internal conflict here um, is land use. So you have within that taxonomy, in a Colombian version of the taxonomy, a, a particular chapter regarding land use in Colombia. Because uh, if we see the, the um, features of how our economy is, is, is developing that deserves a priority. This, this example helps us to understand the differences too. Use the same type of regulatory instruments, but with a different, um, different uh, approach and to, and also uh, use the risk-based regulation to understand what should be a priority according to uh, every country needs. Yeah, absolutely. So many good points there on defining social governance. I think, you know, I was just saying earlier to a different um, speaker that, you know, we often focus on the environmental side in Europe. And that's very true. Even at our conference, we have a lot of session on climate change, net zero. But I, I do want to include more on social impact and governance, although we have a couple of fireside chats on that anyway. Um, and just to take a step back on that note, because you touched on, you know, we often think about social as being about human rights and labor standards, the kind of more obvious stuff, like those kind of violations that you see often in the news. But you mentioned about how, you know, you've been working with fi fintechs on financial inclusion and there are people who don't have access to finance. And that's something that we don't really think about as a, as a human right or a social issue, but it's very important. So could you tell us a little bit about the work that's being done and the innovation around that? We've just got a little bit of time left. Uh, yeah, um, fintech. Fintech, yes, I'm, I mean, it's exciting to understand, particularly for a lawyer, uh, to understand what uh, those who design technology are actually doing. Uh, and uh, for the purpose uh, of Latin American experience, uh, I, could, I could say that we have had the opportunity, we as a country, uh, we have had the opportunity to find in fintech the solution to some of those um, 
limits the financial services it has when dealing directly with social needs. So the idea is that, for example, one of the problems that many, many people had used to have, used to have in Colombia it was access to credit. Let's think about uh, some individuals, but particularly a small and medium enterprise. Uh, they went to the bank, they present all the information when they are able and actually capable of, of meeting all those requirements. And, as, and, and the conditions around interest rates, the time to repay the loan, it might not fit the reality of the small and medium enterprise. So a few years back, let's say for the last five years, it is started a movement in Colombia. And actually they have a, a particular association, which is called Colombia Fintech, um, that gathers all of those who are interested on solving problems that banking sector hasn't solved yet. So in that in that way, one of the uh, uh, paths uh, fintech in Colombia has had to tackle social issues is, to, for example, broader broaden access to credit and to create different lines um, uh, um, considerably more flexible than banking sector li credit lines are um, to provide credit to all those who need it. So very, very small, small amounts, let's say in dollars, which might be the, 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 the currency that we are or, or, or related to, um, around, I don't know, $100 uh, is the, the, the minimum amount to provide those sort of, of, of um, credits and loans. Um, and then when we move into a small and medium enterprises just to find what 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 the the sources will be um used for so if you need for example you have a very small shop uh, in a local um neighborhood and your problem is you have enough money to uh, cover uh, utility service then that a uh, small and very small business can uh, ask a fintech the amount of money that actually needs and then have almost immediate access to that money. Um, proving that the traditional, I mean, the, the, this phenomenon proves that the traditional way we assess credit scoring and, and assign a credit scoring to for, for customers and, 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 and small and medium enterprises can represent somehow the first limit to access to credit. And they have been developing the algorithmic credit scoring when you, uh, I mean, in general, they don't use only uh, financial information but also non-financial information, what would you do in social media, what do you do using Google or any other uh, sort of page like that, um, your web info, web surfing in information, uh, and then you by using big data, you know, and, and all these techniques that, of course, those who work in technology can explain a lot better than me, um, uh, it will help those, this fintech, to uh, make a more realistic profile of those customers and then to design the products according to their particular needs, which is something that traditional banking sector is not until now, it seems not to be interested in doing and in, in, in creating new products and to customize those products. Um, so in Colombia, we, we've seen that um, there's, there was also a um, program during the pandemic um, destined to provide some um, sums, I mean my monthly sums like a subsidy for a, a very particular a part of the population um, that were left unemployed or the business where they work for had to close and so on. So they choose the population with certain criteria, economic criteria, variables of um, that measure poverty, and then uh, ask all these beneficiaries to download uh, an app in, in their mobile phones um, without becoming a customer of a financial institution they had 
through the app the access of the the amount that the government uh, provide to all those people so the 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 program that is being praised on the international level is an example of how fintech can help financial inclusion um it, it make those beneficiaries of a program of subsidies from the national government uh, to download an app and then through the app without becoming an, a customer of the financial institution which is basically the different part here um, and without having to meet certain requirements to have access to a bank's account and bank's products and, and credit lines and so on and um, they just download the app in, into their uh, smartphones and uh, have immediate access to the, to the amount of money that was promised uh, monthly during the pandemic so uh, you see that social issues i mean it's not it's not solving poverty but at least those people in need had access to a very very um a small amount of money but it's something that can help a uh, daily life uh, especially for those who are um, in informality they don't have a permanent job they don't have a permanent income uh, and fintech help a uh, social policy to, to become a reality. So, so we have seen, of course, it's not the entire interest of fintech industry in general, but how uh, the developing the development of uh, customized products to solve particular needs um, is being made by fintech institutions, by fintech startups, uh, instead of financial uh, institutions those banks and so on um, so so that's that's a, a good example of how how we could solve social issues or at least trying to help uh, in this process of solving them uh, by using fintech uh, technology in, in financial services yeah it sounds as if um, derivatives kind of solve the bigger transactional problems as you say and that's more of a long-term change that we need to increase over time but fintech can as you say make that social inclusion a reality sooner and quicker and provide that instant access so I think both have positives and a different role when it comes to solving the world's problems so it's really nice exactly. to see all of this you know you're working across all the different areas and I'm looking forward to hearing more about derivatives at um, TSAM ESG in November so we can obviously continue continue the conversation there and see what's happening by then. Um, but I think that's all we've got time for for now. So thanks so much for joining us. It's been a wonderful to have you. Hey, thank you, Amy. And I'm sure I will, will have a great, great discussions on November and have a very, very nice day, all of you. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching.